my gosh. Hello. Hello. Huh. Hello. Hello. I wonder why so many people are here today. <laughs> yeah, right. You're right. You're here for me. Refer me. No, 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 no. No, that's not. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. You've been discriminating against me and discriminating against some people in the Britain world. And I'm saying that this is the US, this is not China, this is not Russia. This is not Russia. Okay. What you are doing, you are making a monthly of the first amendment. It's been seven months. You've not called on me. You've not my message yet. I'm saying that that's not right. That's not times, welcome, guys. <laughs> welcome. Welcome to the press briefing room. Okay. This is not right. Are we ready? Are we going to behave? While many folks... The quorum, please. Simon. Sorry to our guests. We apologize. Yes, I apologize. I apologize. Okay, while many... While many folks here in U.S. are focused on March Madness or the World Baseball Classic, Go Team USA tomorrow night, by the way, we at the White House today are going to focus on another sport, which is soccer. Or football, as some of my guests might say, <laughs> specifically AFC Richmond. And I can neither confirm nor deny uh, the existence of the Believe ban ban banners that we're seeing around, that you all may be seeing around the White House complex today. It is an honor, it is truly an honor to have Coach Lasso here with us today. <laughs> On a serious note though, because this is actually very serious for the reasons that they all, all hear, uh, Jason and his castmates, and there's a real message around mental health. And they are meeting with the President and the First Lady, as you all know, this afternoon on this important topic. And as you know, the President has made mental health the centerpiece of his unity agenda. And I know that uh, Jason wants to share a few words. And so, Coach Lasso, the podium is yours. I appreciate it. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I, did, I truly did not know it was going to be this one when uh, on the way here. Uh, <laughs> not until we're out here. Uh, and, and uh, so uh, thank you for taking an interest, uh, and I know you're here for bigger reasons than us, but uh, I just want to say that on behalf of myself, uh, everyone here with me today, and the numerous other folks that, that uh, it takes to make uh, our show Ted Lasso, it, it is sincerely an honor to visit the White House and to have the opportunity to speak to the President and to the First Lady about the importance of mental health. Um, so like, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter uh, who you voted for, we all probably, I assume, we all know someone who has, uh, or have been that someone ourselves actually, that's struggled, that's felt isolated, that's felt anxious, that has felt alone, right? And it's actually one of the many things that, that uh, believe it or not, uh, that we all have in common as human beings, right? And so um, that means that we, it, it's something that we can all, you know, and should talk about with one another when we're feeling that way or when we, when we recognize that in someone feeling that way. Uh, so please, you know, we encourage everyone, and, and this is a big theme of the show, is like to check in with your, you know, your neighbor, your coworker, your friends, your family, uh, and, and ask how they're doing. And, and listen, sincerely. You know, I mean, you all ask questions for a living, but you also listen for a living. So, you know, who am I preaching to? The choir, that is. Okay. Um, and look, and while, look, while it's easier said than done, I, I, we also have to know that we shouldn't be afraid to ask for help ourselves. And that, that does take a lot, especially when it's something that has such a, a negative stigma to it, such as mental health. And it, it doesn't need to be that way. And if you can ask for that help from a professional, fantastic. If it needs to be a loved one, equally as good in a lot of ways, because sometimes you just need to let that pressure, that, that pressure valve release. Uh, the president is working on, and his, and his own team, although his team is real, our team is make-believe. Uh, I don't think I don't know that, despite what the people at FIFA and EA will tell you. We are actually a make-believe team. But, uh, you know, they're working very hard to make sure that, the, that you know, that option is available to as many Americans as possible. Uh, now, look, I know in this town uh, <laughs> a lot of folks don't always agree, right, uh, and, and don't always feel heard, seen, listened to, yes? But I truly believe that it, we should all do our best to help take care of each other. That's, that's my own personal belief. I think that's something that everybody up here on stage believes in. That's, that's things we talk about in the writer's room, and we talk about in the editing room, and everything in between. Uh, and just like, you know, we just want to emulate, you know, these make-believe folks that we all play at AFC Richmond and, and the way they take care of one another. That is the wish fulfillment of the show, aside from me playing coach and these guys being professional footballers. You know, that's like, you know, that's, that's, that's a big part of the show. Uh, now, I, the, I can't help but take this opportunity to take 
uh, at least one question. So please, yeah. Ah, wait, hold on here. Decorum, right? That was the word we were using, decorum? Uh, yes, sir, a familiar face. Hi. Fred Krim. <laughs> Fake journalist. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, uh, Trent, nice to see you. How do you feel about Kansas City being one of the named hosting cities for the uh, 2026 World Cup? Ooh, here I was, hoping for a softball. Okay, um, you know what? I'm very excited, truth, truth be told. Yeah, Kansas City is going to be one of these teams. Uh, I mean, I love this town. Uh, what I am genuinely worried about is once we get all these folks from all over the world to come to Kansas City and see our city, eat our food, meet our people, you're going to have you know, a lot of folks that won't want to move away. That's what I'm worried about. Uh, that's it for us, all right? Thank you very much. All right, see you guys. Thank you sincerely so much for having us and, and putting up with us. Now on to... Uh, Greener pastures. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Right. Thank, you. Right. Thank, you guys. Thank, you. Thank 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 you. Excuse me. You don't have a little Joe Biden impression? Nah, I, 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 they got the real one here now. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I need I need fake teeth and you know <laughs> and injected with a lot more hutzpah to pull oh, that off. So. Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just got to say something before we start. I know some folks are probably going to leave the room. Um, make sure. You can't keep discriminating against some people in the briefing room yeah. because you don't like them, you don't like them. So you right. have a choice. No, you, you, you have a choice. You have a choice. A number of people okay. in the briefing room. And I'm saying that that's not right. This is not China. This is not Russia. This is the United Cora! States. This is the White House. No, it's been seven months. I sent you seven months. You're not rest of us are here too, pal. It's been seven months. You guys have not done anything for me. If you have grievances, you should bring them to her later. I have done that. I have done that. All my emails have been ignored. And the press corps is tired of dealing with this. It didn't make about that. you, Simon. understand that you get questioned all the time and you don't the understand why it is to sit here for eight months and be discriminated hey, against. You, you understand you that you're in the front row and you feel comfortable and you get questions all the time. But there are people time. in the back who don't get any questions. Don't make assumptions about what the rest of us do. Mind your manners when you're in here. If you have a problem, you bring it up afterwards. But you are impinging on everybody in here who's only trying to do their job. Okay, Sorry. thank you. I'm saying that you shouldn't discriminate against some people because you don't agree with their question. You're offended by your you question. Your point. We all heard it. All right. Guys, as you all know, many of you know, this is the White House press briefing room, a historic room, a room that should have decorum, a room where folks should respect their colleagues and respect the guests that are here. And I understand that there's going to be give and take. That's the way the press briefing has gone for, for decades before me. And I will always, always respect that. But what I will not, what I will not appreciate is disrespecting your colleagues and disrespecting guests who are here to talk, who were here to talk about an incredibly important issue, which is mental health. And what has just occurred this last 10, 15 minutes is unacceptable. It's it, it is unacceptable. So we're gonna. So we're either going to continue the briefing, or we can just end the briefing right here. Okay. Well then, let's go. Now for my next guest, my colleague John Kirby is joining me here today to talk about President Xi's visit to Moscow and take any questions that you may have. Again, another guest that should be respected in this room and allowed to take questions from the front and from the back, and that's what we do every day, and that's what we're going to continue to do. Get out. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I do, thank you. I do have a, a, a few things to get through, and I promised Corrine I'd try to be as brief as I, I could, but there's a, there's a lot going on, so just please bear with me, and then I'll uh, be happy to take as many questions as, uh, as time will allow. Today, I think, you, as you all know, President Xi is visiting Russia to meet with President Putin. Now, you also probably know that China has already issued a 12-point plan for the conflict in Ukraine, which includes an essential, an essential point, and that's respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. We encouraged President Xi to advocate for this exact essential key point, 
which must include the withdrawal of Russian forces from sovereign Ukrainian territory consistent with the UN Charter. The entire world would like to see this war end, especially the Ukrainians themselves, who have put forward their own plan for a just peace, which draws again on these same UN principles. And let's remember, this war could actually end right now if Russia would, would withdraw its troops from the country. We hope the President Xi will press President Putin to cease bombing Ukrainian cities, hospitals, and schools, to halt the uh, war crimes and atrocities, uh, and to withdraw all his troops. But we are concerned that, instead, China will reiterate calls for a ceasefire that leaves Russian forces inside Ukraine's sovereign territory. Now, any ceasefire that does not address the removal of Russian forces from Ukraine would effectively ratify Russia's illegal conquests enabling Russia to entrench its positions, and then to restart the war at a more advantageous time for them. This would, uh, the, the world should not be fooled by any tactical move by Russia, aided by China or any other country, to freeze the war on its terms without any viable pathway to restore Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Any such attempt, any such attempt would violate the UN Charter and defy the will of the 141 countries that demanded just weeks ago at the UN General Assembly that Russia immediately, completely, and unconditionally withdraw from Ukraine. Efforts to end this conflict must take Ukraine's position into account. And so we encourage President Xi to play a constructive role by speaking with President Zelensky, which he has not done since Russia launched this invasion. Because China, quite frankly, we believe, should hear directly from the Ukrainians and not just from the Russians. And we encourage President Xi to press President Putin directly on the need to respect Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. The world and China's neighbors will certainly be watching closely. Now, I also have a few updates for you on Israel. First, we welcome the understandings re reached in Sharm el-Sheikh yesterday between senior political and security officials of Israel and the Palestinian Authority. This was the second meeting in this particular format following the gathering that was in Aqaba three weeks ago, and it included participation by senior officials from the United States, from Egypt, and from Jordan. The parties held candid and constructive conversations on steps to improve security and stability for Palestinians and Israelis, and on efforts to strengthen the economic stability of the Palestinian people. Meetings at this level have not taken place in nearly 10 years and they help to build a critical foundation to de-escalate tensions and reduce violence. And that's what we want to see happen. We look forward to continuing these discussions as we enter the holy month of uh, Ramadan, Passover, and Easter. Now, President Biden has also spoken, I think, as you know, yesterday with Prime Minister Netanyahu. In that call, he welcomed the meeting in Sharm el-Sheikh and reinforced the need for all sides to take urgent, collaborative steps to enhance security coordination, condemn all acts of terrorism, and maintain the viability of a two-state solution. He also reiterated his unwavering commitment to Israel's security and our ongoing cooperation to counter all the threats posed by Iran, and there are many. The President also stressed that democratic values have always been and must remain a hallmark of U.S.-Israeli bilateral relations. Democratic societies are strengthened by genuine checks and balances, and fundamental changes should be pursued with the broadest possible base of popular support. He offered his support for efforts underway to forge a compromise on proposed judicial reforms consistent with those core principles. And we call on all Israeli leaders to reach such a compromise without delay. Um, on a separate topic, earlier today, I think you saw the uh, President issued a statement uh, welcoming the uh, recovery uh, and soon return of uh, Jeff Woodkey, a US, citizen, a U.S. citizen who had been held hostage in Africa for more than six years. Now, he is safe, and he is in the hands of U.S. government officials. As the President said in that statement not too long ago, we extend our deepest appreciation to the Nigerian government for their help in securing his release. For more than six years, there has been a multi-pronged effort dedicated to locating and recovering Jeff, which was spearheaded by our military, our law enforcement, and our intelligence community working together with French support. Jeff, like other hostages and wrongful detainees, will be offered the best medical care possible, of course, to include post-isolation support. After a full medical screening, he will be united with his loved ones in the near future. I think uh, you can understand why we'd ask you to please allow Jeff and his family a little bit of privacy here. 
uh, as he adjusts to uh, new surroundings uh, and to life moving forward and to coming back into American society. The Biden-Harris administration remains unwavering in our commitment to bringing Americans wrongfully detained or held hostage abroad home to their loved ones, and this is yet another example of the President's commitment in that regard. Lastly, I know it's not lost on any of you that today is the 20th anniversary of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Whatever one thinks about the war and what started it, um, I can tell you two things. One, uh, we're looking ahead. We've got a, a good collaboration, a good partnership with uh, Iraq uh, and Iraqi security forces, who we continue to partner it with uh, in an enable, advise, and assist role, because there's still a viable threat of ISIS there uh, in Iraq and in Syria. And number two, the President and the First Lady remain absolutely committed, as they always have been, to the men and women uh, of, the Amer of our military, as well as across the interagency, who served, fought, died, and suffered in Iraq. Some 4,399 troops did not make it home from the war. More than 30,000 came home forever changed by wounds and injuries. And it's not just them, it's their families that continue to suffer, that continue to sacrifice. There's 4,399 chairs at 4,399 dinner tables that are empty. And it's important for us always to remember that and never forget the bravery, the courage, the sacrifice that went into fighting that war. Again, regardless of how you feel about it, President Biden and the First Lady are going to com stay committed to those uh, to those families going forward. I'm going to start in the back. Go ahead, please start. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, just on Russia, first of all, uh, Moscow has indicated that they'll put a pause on the grain deal by May 18th if the U.S. doesn't comply with some of their demands, which include putting some banks back in the SWIFT system and resuming exports of agricultural equipment. Uh, what's your reaction to that, and what's the plan B if they do halt? So first, I, uh, w w we obviously welcome the extension. It's for, I think, 60 days, uh, not the 120 that I think we were that uh, everybody was hoping for, but 60-day extension, that's a good thing. In fact, over the weekend, I think two ships left with hundreds of thousands of metric tons of, of corn. Uh, and a lot of that corn, a lot of that grain, is heading for low- and middle-income countries that have been suffering, no question been suffering, since the beginning of this war with food insecurity. So it's a good thing, uh, and uh, uh, we're grateful for uh, the work of Turkey, for the U.N. To, to move forward with that. I don't have any, and I won't get into speculating about uh, repercussions one way or another. We're focused on now getting, now that this is extended, making sure we get those ships loaded and get them out and get them to places where they need to be. That's, that's what, uh, that's what the focus is. Can you just remind us of your position on, uh, you know, doubtless there are going to be conversations between President Xi and Putin about assistance to Russia in Ukraine. Um, what is the U.S.'s position on that? And uh, what if China does decide to aid oh. Russia? <laughs> All right. So on the, uh, on the communications, um, hang on, I just want to write this down so I don't forget it. Uh, the, you've heard the president say this himself. He wants to have another conversation with President Xi, and he'll do that. And we'll do that at the most appropriate time. I don't have a call on the schedule to speak to. But it's important that we keep those lines of communication open, particularly now when tensions are so high. That's why uh, we're, you know, we, we still want to get Secretary Blinken uh, back to Beijing. That, visit was postponed, it wasn't canceled, uh, and we're still hopeful that we can get that back on the counter. As a matter of fact, we're having discussions with the PRC right now about potential visit by uh, uh, Secretary Yellen and, and Secretary Raimondo to go over there and talk about economic issues. So there's that that, that, that we're still working. So all, all of that, keeping those lines of communication open, uh, are still valuable. Now, you asked about uh, lethal weapons and uh, a pr provision of, of lethal weapons by, by China. We'll see what they come out of this meeting talking about. I mean, uh, we don't know if, uh, if there's going to be some sort of arrangement. I would just tell you that we still don't believe that China's taking it off the table. We still don't believe and haven't seen any indication that they're moving in that direction or they've made a decision to provide or that they're actually going to do that. Uh, we continue to believe it's not in China's best interest to do that, to help Mr. Putin slaughter innocent Ukrainians. It's hard to believe that they would think that that's in their best interest. It would also run counter uh, to what we've heard President Xi talk about in terms of what his ultimate goal here is. I think he put an op-ed out today talking about sovereignty, territorial integrity, finding a, a peaceful way to end this war, that uh, uh, providing lethal weapons would seem to be inconsistent uh, with that goal. Alex, when Alex, is the right time for a ceasefire? Alex, thank you, thank you, Corinne. Um, Admiral, do you are you encouraged by progress or seeming progress in Israel 
on the judicial reforms. It seems that Prime Minister Netanyahu and his critics agree on some key things, but not others. How do you assess the situation? Well, we're glad that they're talking. Um, uh, the president uh, was uh, was encouraged by the, the the efforts by President Herzog to uh, to come up with some alternatives. We're certainly going to let. Israeli leaders speak to the details of that. This is for them to work out. But one of the messages that President Biden had when he spoke to the Prime Minister yesterday was it's important for those efforts to be fully explored and for compromises to be made, because the beauty of democracy is, in fact, compromise. Uh, and the strength of our of both our democracies uh, is that we believe in checks and balances uh, and, and also in a consensus among the, 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 the populace uh, that to, to make these changes, whatever changes they are, to make them sustainable, all that has to be factored in. Good. Thanks. Uh, just a couple follow-ups here. You, you said that um, you haven't seen any confirmation that China has made a decision yet when it comes to, to providing aid. Why do you think China hasn't made this decision yet? Do you think they're waiting for this meeting today, or? Difficult to know. Um, it, it's hard, you know, we, we uh, couldn't possibly get inside President Xi's decision-making to see, you know, what what he's thinking. Um, uh, China has, as you know, not condemned the war, but they haven't provided lethal weapons. Um, they haven't participated in, in sanctions the way we obviously would have uh, preferred them to do. Um, they, have, they have made their own sovereign decisions, and largely, at least tacitly, many of those decisions have come down on the side uh, of Russia here, including buying into the Russian propaganda that this war is some sort of existential threat to Russia and it's the West or the U.S. and NATO pushing uh, Russia, which, of course, is, is nonsense. I, I can't speak for President Xi and why he hasn't moved in this direction. I would just reiterate here from the podium what we've reiterated to, pro to uh, Chinese officials privately, that we don't think it's in their best interest. It's not going to uh, bring an end to this war any faster. And as I said earlier, it, it certainly appears inconsistent with what President Xi has said publicly about what he wants to see happen. And on the phone call between President Biden and President Xi, what is the holdup here? It, it, you all seem interested in, in talking. Are the Chinese not interested? No holdup. No holdup at all. Um, uh, we want to make sure when we have this conversation, it's at the, it's a, at the appropriate time and in the right context. Uh, President Xi's been kind of busy of late. I mean, he had the, the People's Congress, which just ended. Now he's in uh, Moscow. Um, so look, when it's the right time uh, and uh, for, for, for both leaders, we'll, we'll get him on the phone. But just as importantly to my first answer on this, we're still trying, you know, still interested in, in working towards getting Secretary Blinken back to Beijing. I mean, he was practically on the plane uh, when we had to pull that visit back and postpone it. And as I said, we're having active discussions with the PRC right now about the potential visit by Secretary Yellen and, uh, and one by Secretary Raimondo. Okay. Thanks, John. Um, on, the, uh, on the call yesterday with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, is, was, has there been any discussion within the U.S. government of withholding potentially some military assistance to Israel um, because of the, of the uh, if, this, if these judicial reforms do proceed, there are a number of instances around the world where the, the U.S. Holds, withholds uh, military assistance for de democratic reasons or concerns along one of the One of the main things that uh, President Biden stressed to Prime Minister Netanyahu was our ironclad support for Israel's security and that, that that's going to continue. We face some common challenges in the region, not, not the least of which is Iran. That will continue. And in some different topic, uh, in the other NFC side, the Homeland Security side, in light of some of the discussions regarding protests surrounding the potential uh, future indictment of the former president, uh, you addressed this a little bit yesterday, but you get to, has the White House been briefed on any security concerns or is involved in any operational planning to ensure or uh, investigating threats or otherwise ensure uh, homeland security? I'm not aware of any specific briefings or, uh, uh, or um, specific threats. Um, as I said yesterday, we, we always monitor this, even absent the context of, of those comments. Uh, we're constantly monitoring this, as you would think we should, particularly in the wake of what happened on January 6th. But I'm not, I'm not tracking any individual or specific threats or any um, specific or uh, operational uh, moves by by the federal government. Yeah. Hey, uh, John, does the president plan to invite Prime Minister Netanyahu to Washington for a visit? I, there's nothing on the schedule uh, right now for that on the Russia question. Is there another way to look at President Xi's visit other than a show of support for President Putin? 
I think clearly, look, um, take a couple steps back here. I mean, this is a relationship the, that has been burgeoning of late. Um, uh, these two countries have, uh, have grown closer. It, it, uh, they are both countries that chafe and bristle at U.S. leadership around the world, uh, that chafe and bristle at this idea. I know it's, it sounds like a wonky term, but this rules-based order, inter this international rules-based order, which so many countries um, helped to establish in the wake of World War II, and these two countries, um, they don't like that much, uh, and they'd like to challenge it. And, they, and, and in China's case in particular, they certainly would like to challenge U.S. leadership around the world. Um, and um, in, in President Putin, President Xi, uh, uh, sees a, a potential ally in that effort. Um, for President Putin, he sees in President Xi um, uh, a lifeline of sorts for a, 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 a war that he, he's conducting that has clearly not gone uh, in the, anywhere near the direction he wanted it to go, and a military that is clearly failing on the battlefield. Um, so it's a bit of a marriage of convenience, I'd say, less than it is of affection. Um, and again, we'll we'll see where we'll see where this goes after this uh, after this meeting. But these are not two countries that have, you know, decades long experience working together and full trust and confidence. It's a burgeoning of late, based on uh, America's increasing leadership around the world and trying to check and trying to check that. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about the government of India protest against. There was an attack on the U Indian consulate in San Francisco yeah. yesterday. The doors were broken, windows were broken, and uh, the yeah. graffiti written on the wall. Is the president aware about it? And I haven't seen any action being taken by the San Francisco police yet. Uh, we, we certainly condemn that that uh, that vandalism. Um, it's just absolutely unacceptable. Uh, the State Department's uh, Diplomatic Security Service is working with local authorities. I can't speak for the San Francisco police, but I can say that the, the Diplomatic Security uh, Service is working with local authorities to, to properly uh, investigate, and obviously the uh, uh, State Department is going to be working from an infrastructure perspective to, to repair the damage, but it's unacceptable. Now that you have a U.S. ambassador to India confirmed by the Senate, it has been more than two years now that you didn't have an ambassador to India. Can you look back and say how it, did it impact your ties with India, not having an ambassador on the ground in Delhi? It always helps if you have a Senate-confirmed ambassador in a country, particularly one that's so important, like India, to, uh, to us uh, in the region and around the world. But uh, we didn't let that stop us. Uh, uh, President Biden has prioritized that bilateral relationship. Uh, and even though without a, an ambassador, we uh, we certainly had a very competent charge there and a very competent uh, uh, career staff in the, in the embassy that were able to continue to advance our foreign policy interests and um, in this bilateral relationship and did so quite effectively. But obviously having an ambassador is always uh, important and we look forward to, yeah. to Wait, that. Wait in the back behind Thank you. Um, what is the administration doing specifically to counter the growing Russia and China relationship? What we're focused on is uh, revitalizing our alliances and partnerships around the world and advancing our foreign policy goals around the world um, and in working to strengthen um, the foreign policy objectives and the uh, uh, mutual security uh, objectives that we share with so many other countries. I mean, last week on Monday, the president was in San Diego to unveil with uh, Prime Minister Sunak and Prime Minister Albanese of uh, Australia uh, this AUKUS deal. This is a, an opportunity now to help Australia get their own nuclear-powered submarines. Um, that's just one example. That's what we're focused on. It's, it's, it's not about it's not about countering them. It's about advancing our goals. Thank you. Thanks. China. Russia and China. It seems like this, uh, these two superpowers are teaming up now against the U.S. Why did President Biden let this happen? Peter, these are two countries that have long chafed, as I said to Jeff, long chafed um, at U.S. leadership around the world. Um, and uh, and the network of alliances and partnerships that we have. This is not this is not something that uh, these two countries just cooked up since President Biden got elected. But, but it is he, something he that was, they have been since he's been to. president. He has talked tough. He tried to pressure Putin and Xi 
uh, to act right or risk their standing on the world stage? Does he see now that they don't care? I think if you ask a lot of Russians, they certainly care. I mean, this, the, their economy is, is uh, barely being propped up by some pretty radical measures by, by Mr. Putin. Their military has uh, been uh, roundly embarrassed inside Ukraine, um, and they continue to lose uh, uh, ground there. Um, and as for China, again, take a look at the way the president has really revitalized and restored alliances and partnerships that were let go, if not ridiculed, in the previous administration. We have prioritized them, and there's no other nation around the world that has this alliance and partnership network that we do. Five of our seven treaty alliances are in the Indo-Pacific, and President Biden has prioritized each and every one of them. Specific to these two leaders, though, do you think that Putin and Xi fear President Biden? You'd have to ask them whether, whether they fear or, or, or they Should not. They? It is not about fear. It's Should. about President Biden advancing our foreign policy goals around the world. It's about President Biden revitalizing these alliances and partnerships. It's about President Biden and what he's doing to preserve our national security interests around the world. That's what we're focused on. Welcome back. Thank you. It's been a minute. Um, has the president spoken to Jeff Woodkey or his family yet today? I don't think there's been any direct communication uh, by the president with respect to the family yet. I mean, we're just delighted. This, this news just broke, as you know. We're just delighted to be able to get him back in our hands. We're going to make sure he gets the care he needs. And I'm sure there'll be appropriate communications at the right time. But as I said in my opening statement, we also, this is, I mean, six years. And they just got word today. We need to give the family a little breathing space. And so really quick, um, your reaction to uh, President Putin visiting Mariupol over the weekend? So, look, a couple things there. Um, uh, I mean, I, I certainly won't speak to his travel habits, uh, but Mariupol is far from the fighting. It's far from the front lines. Um, uh, I hope he did get to see. I hope he did get to see the damage and the destruction that his troops did to that city. And I heard in the press release that he was going to look at all the ways they're rebuilding, they're rebuilding Mariupol. <laughs> How about the fact that they shouldn't have to rebuild it because he shouldn't have bombed – sorry. He shouldn't have I, – yeah, I was going to use a word I shouldn't use here. Um, uh, so I hope he got to see what his troops, his military, and his war did to that city. Um, uh, but we'll, but, but uh, we'll let him speak to, uh, to, to, to his uh, – to, to what he came away from. Uh, I would also tell you that it's, it's clear um, that he knows, he has to know, how badly he's doing inside Ukraine. Uh, I mean, more than 50 percent of the territory they took from Ukraine in the first weeks and months of the war, the Ukrainians have already taken back. And the only real active fighting right now is around Bakhmut. And here we are on, what is it today, the 20th? And Bakhmut is still not in Russian hands. Now, they're fighting over it, but the Ukrainians aren't giving up on it. Um, and all the while, we are working to make sure – today we're announcing another uh, package of assistance, $350 million worth of uh, assistance, largely ammunition, to, uh, to Ukraine. While all that's going on, we're working to make sure that Ukraine is well-suited and well-postured to defend themselves in the weeks and months ahead. Okay. Afghanistan. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, two quick follow-ups on China. In your description of the relationship between the two, uh, convenience, not affection, Russia viewing China as a lifeline, do you guys view Russia at this point as a client state of China? I would say there's, um, uh, in that particular bilateral relationship, they, they certainly are the junior partner. Uh, in terms of the lines of communication, the president's talked about this. You've talked about it repeatedly, being critical to the relationship, the bilateral relationship with China. Which lines are not currently open? There was reporting last month about the military. No, no lines were not open. Obviously, economic lines are open. It seems like the secretary well, we're hoping to get the economic lines open. The military to military lines are not open, and that's and that's a problem. Um, that was, as you know, one of the things we were hoping uh, Secretary Blinken would get thawed for us because they are frozen. Uh, and, of course, that trip didn't happen yet, so uh, those lines are, are still not open. But look, through diplomatic channels, we still have the ability to speak with the Chinese, and we are. As I said, we're working with them on a potential trip by Secretaries Yellen and, and Raimondo. Um, 
and as I said earlier, the, the president will absolutely speak with President Xi at the, at the appropriate time. That's still open. Hey, John, can you, I think it's great, can you talk more about the effort to release Jeff Whitkey? Was the White House directly involved in negotiations? Were there any concessions? What, what exactly changed in the last little bit? We were, uh, our, our team here at the NSC was, uh, was involved in this. Of course, uh, Mr. Karsten's uh, special envoy for hostage affairs over the State Department was keenly involved. You saw that the president personally thanked the FBI uh, hostage fusion cell. Uh, uh, for their work, as well as just the, the work across the interagency, as I said in my opening statement, the intelligence community, and other diplomats as well. There was a lot, it was a team effort to get him out. Um, uh, there were no concessions uh, made. Uh, there were no swaps here. Uh, this was just hard, uh, grueling, deliberate work uh, by diplomats and other experts uh, d directly with the uh, uh, with the government of uh, Niger to get him home, and well, hopefully, I mean, he'll be home soon. But uh, but we're looking forward to that. Uh, stay, staying on the continent, uh, Kamala Harris goes to Africa uh, she does. Late, uh, later this week. She does. The first lady has Secretary of State. Has. I, I I wonder what you know at the end. of B Biden plans later this this uh, this year. I wonder at the end of the day, sort of what message you hope to send to to those nations to the continent, um, and is it a, a direct foil, a direct you know. Uh, you know, to, to China, to China's role in the region? So I th the, uh, the, the, the message is the same I, uh, that, that the President delivered when we had the African Leaders Summit here uh, in December, and that's that Africa matters, the continent matters, and our relationships across the continent all matter. And, um, and we work on those relationships one at a time, because every country on the continent is different, has different needs um, and, uh, and different expectations of American leadership. And that's why the president, at the end of that summit, uh, assigned Mr. Carson to be the special envoy for implementation. And uh, you're seeing us now move out on that. You mentioned the vice president's trip. First lady was just there. I mean, we are actively following through on the things we promised we would do uh, at the end of that Africa Leader Summit. So this is very much about Africa, African leaders, African nations, and not about anybody else. Uh, thank you so much. I, follow -up question on no, uh, I have a question on uh, India and China. There is a report from U.S. News saying that the U.S. provided uh, intelligence to Indian military and that helped them repel a Chinese incursion that happened last year. Uh, can you confirm that? And does it mean that, you know, uh, generally speaking, there is more intelligence sharing with India? No, I can't confirm that. James. Kareem, thank you. Admiral, thank you. Uh, two questions focused on China. First, on the Xi-Putin visit. Uh, you and uh, other senior officials have been vocal in recent weeks about your insights into uh, consideration by the Chinese of providing some kind of direct or lethal assistance to the Russians. And that's why you've issued your public warnings against them doing that. One of the little noted aspects of this relationship that I think is important came back in September when uh, Putin and Xi last met in Uzbekistan. And in his public comments, President Putin uh, stated that uh, they were uh, eager to address the concerns about the Ukraine war uh, that the Chinese had raised. So I wonder if you have um, any insights into the nature of those Chinese concerns and what they may have communicated to the Russians about that. I do. I don't. The second question is on the Chinese brokered rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, since that uh, deal was announced, has the United States been able to observe any changes uh, in that relationship, in its security implications for the region, et cetera? I think it's too soon right now, James. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you said there were no concessions made for the release of Mr. Woodkey. Does that mean there was no ransom payment at all? That's right. That's what that means. And uh, Secretary of State Blinken w was in Niger last week. Uh, did he uh, negotiate at all for uh, his release during that trip? He certainly had discussions with uh, leaders that he met there about Mr. Woodkey, as you would expect him to. And, and where is Mr. Woodkey right now? I'm not going to get into the specifics of his location. He's still on the <laughs> continent, but he's in U.S. Uh, He's with U.S. government officials. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Karen. Um, have you, do you know if the Chinese government has contacted Kiev regarding its 12 points plan? And 
What's uh, the Ukrainian government reaction to the plan itself? I certainly would refer you to comments that President Zelensky has already made. I'm not going to speak for him or his administration. Uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I know of no conversations between the Chinese uh, and Kyiv with respect to this so-called 12-point proposal. Thank you, Green. Thank you, Green. Thank you. So we saw the Chinese, as alluded to here, broker a deal between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran, and now the Chinese say they want to broker peace in Ukraine. What role would President Biden play in any negotiations with that? He's already talked to that. He's already said very clearly. Um, uh, when it comes to a negotiated settlement, if it comes to a negotiated settlement, and I'll say it again, it, no reason for it to. Mr. Putin could just pull his troops out, be done. Um, but if and when it comes to that, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Uh, and we will do, and, they, and the Ukrainians will find in us um, uh, a strong and willing partner uh, to help President Zelensky if and when he's ready to negotiate. But it, it, the starting point for us has got to be him. The Ukrainians have to be heard. Their perspectives have to be understood. They have to have a voice in this process. And so uh, it, it's fine for the, the Chinese to go out there and say they want a ceasefire. We'd all like a ceasefire. We'd all like to see the fighting stop. Who wouldn't? But if it stops now, without any consideration of the Ukrainian side, without any discussion between the Chinese and the Ukrainians, without any accession by them to an idea of a ceasefire, it basically freezes in place what Mr. Putin has been able to achieve on the ground inside Ukraine. It's dwindling, but he still has occupied territory in Ukraine, and that's just unacceptable. What's the level of concern? Thank you. Quick, Thank you. Level, um, just real quick. What's the level of concern uh, about the growing influence of China around the world? Then? Well, you can, uh, certainly mindful that China has tried to expand their influence uh, um, uh, all around the world, Middle East, uh, in Africa, in Latin America. Uh, they can speak to their foreign policy goals uh, uh, should they wish to. Um, I can only speak to ours. Um, and our goals are not about countering or, or, or being a block or an obstacle. There's no effort to contain here. It's about advancing what President Biden believes are the appropriate foreign policy goals for this country for the American people, and for the best interests of our allies and partners. And again, I'll go back to what I said before. Uh, no other nation in the world, none, has the a network of alliances and partnerships that the United States does, has, has as many friends around the world as the United States does, who are interested in pursuing the same goals. Secretary Austin just a week or so ago held the 10th Ukraine Defense Contact Group, more than 50 nations, again more than 50 nations at each and every one. And those are voluntary participation uh, events. It's not like we're browbeating people to show up to uh, agree to contribute to Ukraine. That's, that's the power of American convening leadership. And you don't see that power out of either Russia or China. These are two countries who do not have that same network of friends and partners. And one of the reasons why that relation, sorry, that really, he got me all, he got, he got me, no, 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 he, he got me all lathered up. Well, he got me all lathered up now. But one of the reasons why you're seeing that, that tightening relationship is because they recognize uh, that they don't have uh, that strong foundation of international support for what they're trying to do, which is basically challenge American leadership around the world. All right, last, last question. Thank you very much. Um, President, travels, President travels to Ottawa this week, um, and the past president had a difficult relationship with Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, does the United States feel that is that episode is in the past, and or does that relationship need tending? Uh, with Canada, Canada. Oh, uh, we'll have more to say later in the week about the trip to Canada. The president's very excited about doing this, uh, going up there and, and, and really going to Ottawa for no other purpose than the bilateral relationship. He has a terrific relationship with Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, uh, warm and friendly and productive. Uh, there's an awful lot on the on the plate there from everywhere from strengthening NORAD uh, to, uh, to climate change to obviously migration challenges, economic and trade. I mean, there's a bunch of things. We'll have more to say later in the week, but the president's very excited about this. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a couple things and then we'll get going. Uh, as you all know, earlier this month, President Biden released his budget, which will 
The following, invest in America, lower costs and cut taxes for working families, protect and strengthen Social Security, Medicare, and reduce the deficit by nearly $3 trillion over a decade. All while ensuring that no one making less than $400,000 per year pays a penny more in new taxes. The day after the President released his budget, the House Freedom Caucus released their MAGA budget proposal, which is a five alarm fire for hardworking families. Each day this week, we will zero in on how the MAGA budget proposal would be a disaster by endangering public safety, raising costs for families, shipping manufacturing jobs overseas, and undermining American workers, hurting seniors, and weakening national security and our ability to outcompete China. Today, we're showcasing how the MAGA budget proposal would endanger public safety. And here is how it will do that. Make our borders less secure by eliminating funding for more than the 2,000 CBC agents and officers. Defund the police, not fund the police, but defund the police by eliminating funding for 11,000 FBI personnel and 400 local law enforcement positions. Allow an additional 150,000 pounds of cocaine, nearly 900 pounds of fentanyl, nearly 2,000 pounds of heroin into our country. Slash rail safety inspections leading to 11,000 fewer rail safety inspections days next year alone. Jeopardize our air safety by shutting down air traffic control tower services at one third of all U.S. airports. And that's just the start of it. That's just the beginning. So we look forward to sharing more uh, every day this week. Uh, one, one last thing and then we'll get started. We send our best wishes to everyone celebrating Nowruz across the United States and around the world from the Middle East to Central and South Asia and to Europe. The Nowruz holiday brings loved ones together around the Hafsin table to reflect on the year that has passed and renew hope for the year ahead. This year comes at a difficult time for many families when, people is, when, peop, when the hope is needed more than ever, including for the women of Iran who are fighting for their human rights and fundamental freedoms. The United States will continue to stand with the women of Iran and all the citizens of Iran who are inspiring the world with their conviction and their courage. And together with our partners, we will continue to hold Iranian officials accountable for their attacks against their own people. With that, you want to kick us off, Steve? Thanks, Green. It's first a, a quick moment of personal privilege here. I just want to express uh, our apologies to the press corps to the folks watching at home for the display we saw earlier. Our responsibility is to them. We're here to ask questions on their behalf to hold their government accountable because they can't all be here. Um, they, this, is, it, this isn't about us. Um, so with that, uh, for you, there's some calls over the weekend, last couple of days from small mid-sized banks calling on the federal government to ensure deposits above $250,000. Is that something that the president would be supportive of? So don't have any newest announcement at this time for you, uh, and appreciate that, I should say. I appreciate that. Uh, I think the American people appreciate that because that is an important message to send to all of them who are watching. But as you that is the focus of Treasury and the bank uh, regulators. And as you saw, due to our actions this week the, at the direction of the president, uh, Americans should be confident of their deposits, uh, will be there when they, when they need them. And, uh, and so, again, that's what our focus is going to be. We don't have any new announcements at this time, uh, but clearly uh, we want to make sure that our financial st uh, system is stable. In a different topic, uh, Congress has sent the President the COVID origins bill. Uh, does he intend to sign that? Uh, I spoke to this uh, last week. We're reviewing. We're certainly reviewing it. Just don't have anything to share on uh, the president signing the bill at this time or next actions. Thanks, Karine. Um, and I'll join Zeke in what he said earlier. Um, what does the White House make of former President Trump calling on supporters to protest his potential indictment? So, as you know, it's an ongoing investigation. We do not comment on any ongoing uh, uh, investigations from here. We've been very consistent on that. Uh, so certainly I'm not going to uh, break that, uh, uh, kind of break uh, our, our protocol here. So I won't, I won't comment from here. I'm asking about the potential indictment itself. I'm asking about the former president calling on supporters to protest the so that, possibility that he Understood, be understood. Wanted to say that at the top. Uh, so, look, the president has been very clear when it comes to Americans who want to to protest. Uh, they should do it peacefully. 
Uh, and that is something that is incredibly important that the president has always uh, continued to say. But I don't want to get into, um, you know, hypotheticals for Mir. Uh, and so I'll just leave it there. There's one other thing related to this that isn't hypothetical, because now House Republicans are requesting to speak with the Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, about his ongoing investigation into former President Trump. Is that the view of the White House, a proper use of federal taxpayer dollars to investigate or try to find out what a local prosecutor is Again, I'm, I'm just not going to, to speak because that, that is an underlying connection uh, to, to, the, uh, to the investigation, just not going to comment from here. Uh, look, our, the President is going to continue to focus on what the American people need, their priorities. Uh, we're going to continue to, focusing on, to focus on lowering costs. We're going to continue to focus on the President fighting for Medicare, uh, Social Security, uh, ACA. That is what the President is going to do. Look, if Republicans, and the President has said this over and over again, uh, if they Republicans want to work with us in a bipartisan way to deliver for the American people to continue to build on the successes that we have seen in the last two years when it comes to the economic policy, building an economy from the bottom up, middle out. Uh, he's willing to have that conversation. Well, we saw what the president proposed on Friday regarding changes to how the FDIC oversees banks and executives at banks specifically. Has he been in touch directly with any business leaders or who was it here at the White House that may have had conversations with Warren Buffett, for example? So, so I've seen the reports of, on Warren Buffett uh, uh, that you all have been reporting on. Don't don't have anything to read out or to, to lay out on any conversation, uh, and so I'll just leave it there. And the president himself, otherwise, just just don't have anything to to read out on conversations that the president may have had with anybody from the business sector or outside of outside of the of the White House. What I can say is, and we've said this many times before, he has been kept regularly updated uh, by his economic team, by the chief of staff, uh, and that continues. Thank you. Just to, to put a follow-up on Ed's question about the former president's uh, message to his supporters, you know, given what we've seen in the past when the former president has urged his supporters to, to take our nation back, um, are you concerned and worried as an administration about the threat of violence? So look, we, we are always prepared. I can say that from here. Uh, I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals uh, or uh, any potential scenarios, but we are always prepared. And, uh, on the issue of banking, um, there's some reporting that Warren Buffett has been in touch with the administration, you know, playing a role in, in, in sort of helping to advise as you address the banking crisis. Can you confirm that? Can you comment on, on any conversations with Warren Buffett? Yeah, I, I think. Um, I think Ed just asked that question. Okay. <laughs> Mary. <laughs> No, I just don't have uh, anything for you at this time. I can confirm that that I have not had a conversation with Warren Buffett, but no, I just don't have anything to, to read to, to read out at this time. No problem. Uh, just following up on the on the broad question about banking, can you give us a sense of the next steps in this? You expressed confidence that the banking system is strong, but there's still some jitters out there. Understood. Uh, look, the president has already called for Congress uh, to make it easier for regulators to do the following: claw back compensation. Uh, impose civil civil penalties and ban executives uh, from working in the banking industry. He will also uh, going to call on Congress and bank re regulators to strengthen the rules uh, for larger banks so this doesn't happen again. As you know, and I've said this many times before, in 2018 we saw that the previous uh, uh, administration rolled back some of the tough requirements put. Put, under, put in place under the uh, Obama Biden administration, and so which was, which was put in place to strengthen uh, the financial system. So, uh, so the administration is again is going to actively look into what regulations or laws uh, should be strengthened to prevent this from happening again. But look, the actions that we saw this weekend, the actions that we have seen over the past 10 days or so, uh, should give uh, the American people confidence uh, that the, that uh, you know depositors will have their money will be there uh, when they need it. And so uh, again, we have done everything that we can to make sure that. Uh, we hold the we hold um, the managers of these of these bank accountable, uh, and uh, and that this does not affect and we don't put on the hook the taxpayers or the American people. Is the president worried, or is the White House worried about the politics of this in terms of banks getting bailouts and average Americans, so to say, not? So look. I the, the president made a commitment to make sure, uh, and you heard, you heard also um, 
Secretary Yellen speak to this last week and be, making sure that they're not put on the hook for this, right? Making sure that uh, we make that the investors, as I just mentioned, the managers uh, are, you know, are, are held accountable. And so the President has made decisive force and forceful actions to strengthen, again, the public confidence in our banking system. No taxpayers' uh, money is being used or put at risk uh, in, with these actions that have been taken over the last 10 days or so. Uh, and our banking system remains sound. That is something that you heard from Secretary Yellen directly herself uh, just last week. And this is all done because of the President's direction that he asked uh, the, regula the regulators to take a look at, that he asked the Treasury uh, Department to take a look at and make sure that we make these decisive actions. And again, we just saw this some decisive action this weekend. And so we want to make sure, and we're doing this, to make sure that the Americans are confident, American people are confident in the work that this administration is trying to do uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that we meet the demands of resources for depositors are met. Um, does the President believe that the actions of the last 10 days, which have been pretty extraordinarily extraordinary in scale and scope, are enough? That we're past this, we're through this, um, the system is going to be good to go from now on. So, look, um, when you think about the accountability that the President put forth just on Friday, uh, which focused on ensuring that senior bank executives are held fully accountable, uh, it builds on our work to ensure key executives that, that ran Silicon Valley, for example, Silicon Va Valley Bank and Signature Bank are removed and investors in these uh, two banks are, take their losses. But again, Congress should act, should make it easier for regulators to claw back those compensations that I mentioned, impose civil uh, penalties and ban executives uh, from working in the banking industry again. So look. We t the President took the necessary actions uh, to meet the moment that we're in now. He believes that Congress can needs to continue to act. We're going to continue to have those conversations. Of course, there are things that we can do without Congress, which is what we're seeing the regulators do. Uh, but this is, a, this is a partnership. This is also, we have to do this in hand uh, with Congress. So of course, m more should be done and can be done. And just one quick follow-up. Should, do you guys view this, you said the issue of confidence several times in terms of how people are perceiving this right now. Do you view this primarily as a confidence issue, not a system issue or some bigger problem in terms so of So we want to make sure, I think it's important, the President believes as President of the United States, as we're seeing what occurred uh, these last, again, 10 days or so, I've lost count, but uh, that Americans should have confidence, right? They should have confidence in the banking system, uh, should, they should have confidence in the actions that the regulators uh, have taken, uh, that, again, at the direct the direction of the, of the President. Uh, and it, as you asked me, should there be more work to be done? Absolutely. We should not let Congress off the hook. They should take actions in making sure that moving forward Forward, uh, that our banking, uh, uh, but we're in a different place than we were in 2008 because of uh, because of the because of the regulations that we saw from in the Obama Biden White House, and so that matters as well. Okay. To follow up on that, Kareen, you said that there are things that um, the White House or the administration can do without Congress. Do you have a timeline on this, at, on when these so, will see that? Would yeah, that days it's or weeks? It's a good question, JJ. Look, uh, we're already seeing some of that underway uh, as regulators have taken action over the last few uh, few years to reverse uh, the last administration's deregulation, and that is because of, again, the actions under this president. Uh, and so we've seen that, uh, but again, we cannot take Congress off the hook. Uh, and uh, the regulators are going to take, continue to, to do what the President asked of them, the, it, again, these past two years. Uh, but again, Congress has to act. We need to make sure that they do their part in this as, as the President is uh, make, taking actions uh, to give the American people confidence. Go ahead. Does the President view Jerome Powell's stewardship of these events as um, at all a risk to his position as Chairman of the Federal Reserve? No, not at all. The President has confidence in Jerome Powell. The shares of First Republic Bank have declined in recent days. Is the administration considering any further steps to support that bank, and do those options include uh, potentially the FDIC taking over the bank? So, look, that's something for the FDIC to, to speak to. Uh, I'm not just I'm not going to comment on any hypotheticals from here. Senator Warren um, was on a number of Sunday shows yesterday. She has said the Federal Reserve should stop hiking interest rates uh, in an effort to. Go control the high inflation given the circumstances that we're in. What's the president's level of concern that another rate increase this week 
could further weaken the banking industry and potentially threaten some of these smaller and mid-sized banks? So look, I understand the question as it relates to the Federal Reserve. We've been very clear. They are independent. Uh, they will make, uh, the President believes that. The President has been very clear uh, on that. Uh, and they are going to make their decision, their monetary policy decision as it relates to interest rate, as it relates to uh, dealing with inflation, uh, which are clearly both connected. But I'm just not going to, we're not going to comment on that from here. Um, how is the, switching gears to climate a little bit, how is the White House dealing with the new intergovernmental panel on climate change report that came out today? Are there plans to change anything that the administration is doing or just carry on the programs and plans you have right now? So they have not spoken to our team about the report, so we need to, to go back and um, and, and get their assessment on, on the report that you just mentioned that came out. So just don't have anything to share at this time, but happy happy to come back to you on that. And in terms of preparations for any protests or rallies, what do those preparations look like? Uh, I'm just not going to get into uh, any any details from here. I think I answered this question uh, just a little bit uh, to your colleague, and I just said we're all we're always prepared, uh, but certainly not going to get into hypotheticals. Go ahead. Um, what's happening with the Cuban baseball defector, and are there any concerns about how that might impact any relations with Cuba? I don't have anything to share at this time uh, on that question. Uh, go ahead. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Kareem, while, while we've been in here, uh, there's been a couple of stories that have started to come out about the economic report of the president. Uh, I think there's an AP story and a New York Times story. Uh, do you have anything more to share on when that report's coming out and any of the, the top lines from it? I don't have anything to share at this time. When we're ready, we certainly will share that with all of you. Go ahead, Courtney. Go ahead, Courtney. Thanks, Green. I wanted to ask you, um, state leaders are campaigning for abortion access amendments to be put on the ballot in 2023 and 2024. One example um, that's gaining some steam is in Ohio. Is the administration doing anything to support this effort um, or tracking those ballot initiatives given that you... Can you go back to what you said before you said Ohio? What What is... Yeah. Ballot initiatives, there's leaders that are trying to put ballot initiatives for 2023 and 24 for abortion access. Abortion access to abortion, to abortion access. Access. Kind of like what we saw in Kansas, um, gaining traction to do that in other states. Well, look, we the president has been very clear about um, uh, what, especially the day that Roe uh, was no longer the, the uh, law of the land, that we needed to do everything that was possible uh, to make sure that we protect women's rights, uh, women's rights to health care, and he's been very clear about that. Uh, I don't have any specifics to say if, uh, on those particular uh, potential uh, pieces of legislation, uh, but clearly we welcome uh, legislation that's going to support that, that's going to support uh, women having being able to make their own decisions on their health care. Uh, and it is shameful. It is shameful that we're seeing extreme uh, elected officials out there uh, talking uh, talking about national ban uh, on abortion. And uh, we're going to continue to call that out. Uh, we should not be uh, talking about taking away the freedoms of Americans uh, across the country, of, of women across the country. Uh, and so we're going to continue to to be very clear about that. Uh, but certainly, we would support uh, uh, legislation that helps expand the access uh, uh, for women. And if you could provide an update of the case in Texas on Mifepristone. Um, I know that you've gotten that question a couple times about how you're preparing. We still don't obviously have a court order, but can you provide an update for people who are listening, who are worried about this decision and how it might affect their care? Yeah, I want to be very careful. It's a, it's a, as you know, the decision has not happened. It's a, it's an ongoing litiga litigation. But I've spoken at this podium before how unprecedented uh, if uh, if the decision uh, you know were to ban a pill that has been around uh, for more than two decades, that's in pl in more than 60 countries. Uh, but again. This is about the FDA's authority to make it its independent, evidence-based decision on drugs. And so those decisions on what medication can be used in our country should not be determined in court. And they should be determined based on their safety, science, and the data. And so I uh, want to be very clear, but uh, so we'll wait. Uh, we'll await uh, steps uh, here and speak on this once the decision has been made. Uh, but again, uh, you know, the president is going to continue to be uh, very vocal when it comes to uh, uh, protecting women and their rights to choose for themselves, for their own body, on, uh, on how they want to proceed and move forward with health care. Um, okay. Go ahead, Ariel. 
so much. Um, tomorrow, the president will uh, take part in this um, White House Conservation in Action Summit at the Department of Interior, where he will, and I put the guidance, highlight the administration's actions and historic investments for the environment and nature. Uh, but just a few days ago, he greenlighted uh, the Willow Project in Alaska. So this, it looks like he's sending conflicting signals here. So can you maybe elaborate on, on what his approach is uh, on the environment and what he's telling, especially young activists who protested the Willow Project? Yeah, I, I you know, I would disagree with that. As, as we have said before, uh, the step that the Department of Interior had, ta had taken uh, was because of certain legal constraints. So we have to remember that these, these were legal, this was part of a legal uh, kind of decision, as I explained last week. And uh, tomorrow's event is about building on the President's historic climate and conservation record, which the President is very proud of. If you think about uh, what the President has done, uh, protected more lands and waters in his first year than any President since JFK. Uh, he just last week, he declared the, the entire U.S. Arctic Ocean off limits to new oil and gas uh, leasing. Uh, and so, and the Interior Department also announced it's preparing new regulations to protect 13 million acres in Alaska. And so, you know, the President is going to continue to fight uh, for our climate, to protect our, our climate and take those actions. Uh, he's made the largest ever uh, in investments in conservation and restoration of our lands and waters. And so the President is very proud of his record, uh, and he certainly will never back down from it. Yeah, Karen. Uh, do you have any details of the Arts and Humanities, Humanities Award ceremony tomorrow? I do. I do have some information to share with all of you. That's uh, the awards that are happening tomorrow. Um, so, um, oh, give me one second here. So he's going to, the President's going to host uh, in the East Room Ceremony at the White House to present the 2021 National Humani Humanities Medals and the 2021 National Medals of Arts. Uh, First Lady uh, Jill Biden will attend the ceremony as well. We will have uh, more on the recipients of the awards later today, but don't have anything to preview, but certainly we'll have more to share. And this will be, I believe, the first one uh, in this administration in the past two years. Okay. Uh, I'm trying, who have, I have not called them. One more. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Brian. Black Green. I wanted to ask into the FBI and the ATF in Waco. Is, is the Biden administration concerned about anti government activity in Waco around the rally? Are there security concerns that President Trump may use this anniversary to foment um, anti government sentiment at that? So, you know, I can't speak to what uh, the former president's going to do or say. Uh, what I, I'm not tracking uh, any, uh, any security concerns, uh, so don't have anything more to share beyond that. All right, everybody, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.